with a musical composition by Neil. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Keep, so why'd you stop? Come on. I'm so moved right now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if you open with that, the viewer base will be gone. <laughs> All 28 people. <laughs> So bad, thank but you, good. Thank you, thank but you very much. Uh, if if you made an album, I would I would buy it. I might make an but album, but you gotta you gotta sell it for like fifty cents, because anything more than that is just highway. It's robbery. gonna be for fifty cent. For fifty cent, it's gonna be your, it, fifty cent is gonna produce your fifty cent album. Yeah, mm. you could sell it for five million. You only got to sell like one, two handful. Yeah, that's true. One really, one really. Oh, for God's sake. Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am your host, Johnny Blackburn, and alongside me this week, as they are every week, are my secret love interests. Gary Elmore. And the one and only Neil Riley, question mark? Not, not Neil Re Whoa, question mark. I was going to give you a, I was going to give you a really badass WCW en entrance, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, this week we are... Pleased to be joined by the one, the only, the man with the plan, the man who needs no introduction but insists on having one anyways, Michael the Killer Payne. Mm. Michael, welcome to the show again. Thank you. I do insist on having an introduction. Makes me feel good. <laughs> if you want to write one for me every time you're on the on the show, then I'll say it. That seems like a lot of work, really. Okay. <laughs> so just whatever off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, for those of you that uh, recall, Michael uh, popped his cherry in podcast land with us last week with the Star Trek episode, and so we are happy to welcome back again. Uh, this week, popping her cherry in podcast land for the first time, at least with yikes. this series, we've yeah, got yikes. we've got the master of disaster, the lady of the evening, the lady of the lake, if you will, Miss Jessica Simpson. Jessica Simpson. That'd be great. Can we get were, Jessica you Simpson? To, were you trying to remember my middle name? No, what was that? I, was, I was trying to like, I was trying to combine some type of nickname with hail. And I was like, storm, storm, hail. That's not a thing. Um, you aced it. Yeah. So Jessica hail storm. But that throws people off. You got to make the middle name has to be the start of the nickname. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be. Anyways. Storman Norman. Storman Norman George Foreman. Hey, uh, Jessica, thanks so much for joining us. We've been trying to get, I've been trying to get Jessica on since season one. And He's also been trying to get her off since season one. Uh, oh. oh. That's what Neil said. Well, that's <laughs> called harassment. Not what she said, because that's not accurate, Neil. Not true. Okay. All right. Uh, um, <laughs> Jessica's regretting getting on this uh, episode, so I will jump right into uh, our topic for the evening, which is romance movies and rom-coms for all of you lovebirds out there and all of you single folks that are hopeless romantics. This is the episode for you. Oh, yeah. Turning it down to slow romance. Slow jazz slow. with Johnny B. And... Gary E. And Michael P. And Neil Reed. B. <laughs> and what are you guys Jessica doing? Jessica E. <laughs> Jessica E. Jessica. I, is there, what's your, Je, I mean, Jessica's, your middle name is, is it's Catherine, right? Yeah. So is Good there some E at the, at, yeah, I remember. What, what's your date of birth and your address and your social? <laughs> 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 Take a photo of your pink slip and send it to me. Uh, <laughs> car. A car. Really? Does it require that look between the two of you? Shut your faces. Do we share right. looks? I don't know. I don't, you I guys like share I looks all the you. time. The only people who share looks more often than the two of you are you and Tom. So, Tom and I, I know, do share a lot. I know when you're lying, Gary. <laughs> I know when you're lying. 
We're talking about something today. <laughs> We're talking aren't we? about something. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this episode uh, will be coming out just in time for Valentine's Day, or for some of you, Happy Singles Awareness Day. Uh, so we're going to be breaking down all of the classics, uh, and surprisingly, there are actually multiple subgenres of the genre of romance, and we're going to break those down and uh, analyze those as well, and talk about our favorite. Most memorable, most overrated, and uh, the romances that we've forgotten that we shouldn't have because they're all classics. Some of them, very few of them. We'll debate it here. Uh, so we already we already went ahead and listened to Gary's uh, little "My Heart Will Go On" uh, song there. So, so <laughs> that, that was great. That was a thing that happened. <laughs> Uh, I put that on the itinerary, and I, I didn't realize you were gonna have your penny whistle with you. I was totally I always joking. Have my penny That's whistle. fantastic. He's a pleasant always surprise. ready. He's always ready. Um, so I, I do want I do want to ask since this is technically our, our Valentine's Day episode, um, just a, a brief little history for uh, for each of us. What what does everybody enjoy doing on, on Valentine's Day? Whether you're in a relationship with somebody or not, um, do, do you guys have any traditions that you do? You know, normally like a Christmas thing or maybe something you do on Fourth of July or. I uh, normally. Jesus, Jesus Christ! Okay, <laughs> my parents cannot listen. To yeah, this I was about to say my mother can't listen to this episode. Thanks a lot, Dick. I'll cut uh, that out. <laughs> Just bleep it, okay? <laughs> People have to guess I what you're saying. <laughs> oh yeah are there any movies in particular i guess is what i'm getting at that you watch you know, religiously when it comes to valentine's day whether it be by yourself or or with your significant other um jessica what about you what do you what do you typically you know snuggle up on the couch with and, and pop into the well, well i was gonna say pop into the vcr but that that's not really mr so, yeah. socks and i were thinking about doing a puzzle on sunday maybe oh, like yeah. crafting no um okay. i don't really celebrate right. valentine's day usually okay. i do stuff with like my niece and nephew like cute like kid stuff yeah but yeah and i feel like that we you, you do like you know you make the little cards for their classmates and whatnot maybe you make like the valentine's day box and 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 you and you give it to their their little class yeah i mean that's i guess that's a thing that i i did that when so I was yeah a like I, I have some little gifts for them and that's it I don't know. It's not a big day for me. I do have it's, romantic movies that I like that I religiously watch, but not mm -hmm. necessarily on specifically B -Day. on B Day. Yeah. Okay. All right. I for some reason have kind of fallen into watching watching The Notebook, and maybe that's just because I've been in a relationship for the last couple of years. But that's kind of been my thing. Um, I'm sorry. Well, listen, I, don't care I if didn't. Hate even, it. That's a damn good movie. I love. I, love it the is good. I didn't put it on any of my list though. I didn't even think of it. Huh. Well, it's a classic, and I, I know we're going to get into that one later. Um, the Notebook but, does have James Garner. It does it. have James Garner. It's very true. It does. <laughs> he plays <laughs> it older. Amazon is remaking The Notebook. Are they no. really? What? Yeah, it's going to be called The Kindle. Stop it. It's mm -hmm. so stupid. <laughs> Damn it, dude. That was so bad. I love it. God. Wonderful. Neil, what do you normally do on, on a, on a V-Day? Uh, well, historically, I... Uh, Probably I'm working uh, because I work one of those jobs where, you know, I'm always That's working. Uh, mm -hmm. So usually I come home and I'm getting yelled at for being at work. Um, and then I go to sleep angry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That is so romantic. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's, it's our that, special little thing. That's what they should make the Kindle about. That should be the plot line. Just a day in the life of, <laughs> of, of a guy that does your job and then goes home and gets yelled at. Goes to bed angry. It's like on the waterfront. It's like, ah! <laughs> no, wrong, wrong movie. But... Yeah, close enough. No, one was Streetcar Named Desire and one Whatever, was, one was another movie with Marlon Brando. <laughs> There's the connection. Though. Yeah, boom. And James Garner was, was the one. In, in neither was of those. in neither of those. <laughs> Uh, Michael, what do you typically do on Valentine's Day? Uh, there's not really like a traditional movie, I would say, that we watch for Valentine's Day. Okay. Um, it's mostly dinner and just kind of spending time together. For Although sure. I also work a job that you consistently have to work and don't get holidays off and end up hating your life while doing it. Okay. So, yeah, without the yelling, though, I don't really have a lot of that. That's good. That's that's good. I mean, you know, adding a little yelling, add some spice to your life, though. So that could also be a good thing. Possibly. Maybe. Maybe. Who doesn't want an early death? Yeah. You know, <laughs> just just a heart attack at 35, you know? <laughs> Gary, Gary what about you? What do you like to do outside of, you know, 
yelling at yourself in the mirror. Well, I was cutting that part out, Johnny, but uh, <laughs> whatever. We're circling back. <laughs> circling, yeah, keeping the money moving. Mm. Keeping the money moving. Uh, well, I also work a job where I have to work uh, nights, weekends, and holidays and hate my life. Um, so I usually come home after that and just sort of cry myself to sleep. But do you work on Sunday? Oh, actually, Thursday. actually, no. Uh, this year, I think I'm off. So. Hey, there you go. Yeah. Oh. What, so what are you going to do? Probably just uh, stay home and cry. Yeah. And yell at yourself in the mirror? No, I'll probably skip that part. Okay. Just record yourself playing Penny yeah. Whistle. I might do. We might have an extra podcast. It's just me playing the Penny Whistle, folks. I don't know if anybody will So something to that I've done in the past, something that women do if they're single is they have a Galentine's Day. And you and that. all your best girlfriends get together and have a dinner and celebrate okay. with each so other. What, what would be the guy version of that? What if a bunch I, of dudes wanted to do it? What it'd be dude dude in times day. Well, I'm I'm pretty sure they do have Galentines, which is <laughs> yeah. kind of based off Galentines. Yeah, and that's also a bunch of dudes that are getting together, just maybe not in the way you're thinking. Probably not. Because yep. I was thinking a group of heterosexual individuals. Right. But that's not what you're describing. No. Right. So but can you describe what you pretend? Can you go into detail on what you're talking about? Not unless you're a card carrying member. Can I go into detail? <laughs> Just like the stone masons, just more exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're just going to cut this entire intro. Is that what no, we're doing? No, no, no we're leaving it. It's great. <laughs> we're going to jump in. Um, so, so romance films—they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, and just like I want to preface this before we really jump into it, just like every other genre episode we've ever had, we understand. Just so everybody knows, and listeners, we understand that there are a mix of genres. So when we're looking for romance movies, the plot line has to be driven by a romantic relationship involved between two people. Okay, if if that's if that's a subplot, that's that's not a that's not a primary romance. Just just so we're on the same page, and, and we're happy. I'm happy to debate all the ones that we bring up, but just wanted to say that so we're all on the same page to start off. Um, so apparently, when I was doing a little bit of research on this, there are subcategories of the actual genre of romance and outside of just romance films and rom-coms i never really thought about it i didn't really think that there could be subgenres. um so the first one i came across was historical romances period pieces um things of that nature and i guess if we really dive into it we can we can think of a couple um michael what's one that pops to the top of your head we were talking about it earlier well i mean if we're talking about historical pieces that are romance there's so many out there. Um, Gone with the Wind Ooh. is going to be the first one that pops up. Okay. Um, Marie Antoinette mm -hmm. is another one that pops up. You've got Elizabeth mm -hmm. is one that pops up. Those are probably the big three that I can think of just off the top of my head. Right. To have that. There's a relationship that's kind of driving the story forward. Right. Elizabeth, maybe not as much, but that romance element is there. So, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty important. That's that's that is for sure. So from that from that list itself, I know you are a big Gun with the Wind fan. Yes. OK. All right. <laughs> I, I'd like to take just a quick second to discuss that, because um, I, I would like to know why you are such a fan of that film. Gone with the Wind. It's at this point, it's kind of like comfort food, right? Which okay, is how, how they describe a lot of romance movies in general, especially rom-coms. Mm -hmm. They talk about them as being comfort food for emotion, comfort food for the soul, just kind of make you feel good by the end of it. Mm -hmm. Gone with the Wind is a lot of comfort food for me. Mm -hmm. I know it's got its it's parts that are controversial and it's it's got its its debates back and forth about its relevance and and everything surrounding it but right. just the story alone and and the characters that are involved and the struggles that they have to go with and just the over the top drama that's involved in it every single time it it just captivates me it's it's so kind of like a telenovela before they even came around just Daytime soap, yeah, but in in a classy, well done form. Yeah, I mean, classy, probably debatable on that one, but <laughs> there's just a lot of great scenes and a lot of quotable moments and a lot of a lot of things that just bring a smile to your face as you're watching it. At least for me. So the reason that I had I had asked you to bring that up, why that was one of your favorites, is I I mean I haven't seen this movie since I was I was probably a teenager the last time I saw it, and I really couldn't remember the entire thing. It's just so damn long. Um, 
but I remember it being really boring. And granted, I was a teenager, so if I watched it now, who knows? Um, do you think a film like that, though, would stand up to the romances that have come out today, over maybe over the last 30 years, due to the fact that I asked that because there's just so much more competition now at this point. Back then, you only had a few blockbusters coming out every year as opposed to, I mean, you know, tens, if not, you know, over 100. Not in 2020. Well, not in 2020, Gary. Good point. But it's, you know, typically. <laughs> right. Do I think Gone with the Wind would stand up to competition from today? Like, for you know, Gone with the Wind won its awards and, and had its popularity. Yeah, even over its the time. last 30, 40 years, you know, it doesn't have to be just the 20. Right. Teens, would but... it still have its popularity? I think it would be have to be done in a different way, for sure. Okay. Audiences, I think, are a lot different than they used to be yeah um when you when you used to go to the theater you had your intermissions you had it was more like going to the theater than anything else so you had a lot of those tropes that carried forward sure from going to to view those i don't think modern audiences probably have a lot of tolerance for that i also don't think they can sit through that many hours of a story going back and forth without it really driving forward yeah uh, i think there's a lot more character development than you'd probably see in modern movies because they're going to assume the audience is following along and they don't need to show you or tell you that this is happening the audience can pretty much get that yeah that's what's going on we don't need to to visit it mm -hmm. but yeah it's it, I, I honestly don't think it could hold up with modern audiences as well they would have to cut it way down they'd have mm -hmm. to change a bit of the structure on it yeah they probably have to remove some of the controversial stuff that's involved just to even get it past uh preliminary screenings and stuff like that i exactly. feel like they they would have to also on top of doing that they'd have to almost make it spicier if you will as far as the drama aspect goes like cut down on certain aspects but enhance others almost. right i mean what they would do is they'd end up turning back to the source material and bring a lot of that in that they cut out from the original movie i mean geez there's rape scenes and there's all kinds of stuff that was in the original book that they weren't allowed to bring into the movie itself so right. you'd probably see a lot more of that in there for sure jess where do you think uh, where do you think gone with the wind would fare in today's day and age compared to other romances i mean <clears throat> i think that if we were adapting it and making it now, it would be much better suited for maybe like an HBO miniseries or something like that. Um, okay. Yeah. Make it more episodic, I think, mm -hmm. than one really long movie. Right. Do you, do you think it would, do you, either of you think it would lose the appeal that it originally had if they didn't turn it into an episodic format and just cut it down from, you know, three and a half hours to, let's say, two or two and a half? Do you think it would lose too much and it would lose that, that grandeur? Absolutely. I think it would lose a lot of what it had originally because there's a lot of great cinematic moments that happen that they wouldn't be able to show or they wouldn't allow to breathe in there. The burning of Atlanta, the right. when she returns to Terra and she's, you know, she's coming to grips with the fact of what she's dealt with during the war itself. And uh, just a lot of those, uh, just the shots that they did with the camera and everything, they're not going to be able to, to include that just because of the length of the film itself. So... I think that the having it be that episodic, this the streaming services and the rise of that would really be its best opportunity to bring it back. Yeah. Um, is it something that needs to be brought back? In my opinion, no. I, I think we need to move forward and we need to have new stories and new ideas and, and new things out shit. there. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that, that would be nice if Hollywood came up with, you know, more original scripts and and quit remaking all of the blockbusters that, you know, made millions upon billions back in the day. Uh, Gary, I know that one of your favorite films falls into this category. Um, so Casablanca, let's 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 jump into that. Um, you know, for uh, honest, honestly, a lot of our listeners and even other people that may just be tuning in for the first time for this episode have probably not seen Casablanca. They may have heard of it but they probably haven't seen it. Um, why do you think that stands the test of time as one of the greatest, not only romances, but best films to ever be made? I think that Casablanca is a movie that really sp speaks to the human spirit in a lot of ways. Uh, you've got Rick Blaine, who's played by Humphrey Bogart in the movie, and he's kind of set in a, uh, a city, Casablanca, that uh, is sort of the the jumping off point between the war torn Europe and the United States. Sure. And it, it's got a lot of elements of, um, it's less of a romance movie than some of the other ones that we're going to talk about, sure. but it, it definitely has a strong sense of human bonds between, uh, Rick and Elsa. Um, and she ends up 
bringing out the best in him, which I think is a really inspiring note to have in a movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's just so many great scenes and lines in that movie. I think uh, AFI's top 100 lines, seven of them come from Casablanca and five of them come from the last uh, three minutes of the movie. Right. Exactly. And uh, to me, Casablanca is just a perfectly done movie. And I don't think you can watch it and not uh, get very emotional at it. OK. All right. Uh, so, Jess, back to you. Same question I posed to Michael earlier with Gone with the Wind. Do you think that if they tried to remake Casablanca within the last 30 years, it would still stand up to the competition that's currently being uh, shown out today? Casablanca is something that people still watch. And I also think that it's one of those movies that people aren't going to touch, you know, um, they're going to just leave it alone. So I don't know if it's I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you're you're personally I mean, are are you a big fan of of when they you know, I mean, it seems like over the last decade in particular that Hollywood has just completely gone about this the wrong way, in my opinion. But they've just they've completely just exploded with the idea that, oh, we have to remake all of these really famous movies from the last 50, 60 years. And that's what people want. I mean, do you think that's do you, do you appreciate that? Do you think it's something that that needs to be done or should are you in the same boat as Michael? We should just, you know, close the vault on those films and start making new stories. I think necessarily, you know, I mean, I think about something like Little Women, who, which is kind of like a rite of passage movie for right. girls and young girls. And, um, you know, the 94 version was one that I watched religiously. And I feel like that movie's remade every generation, same with like a star is born. Some stories are so classic and, and people, you know, directors and writers who have a, you know, a close connection with certain stories really want to retell it from their perspective. Right. Um, and sometimes it can be great. Sometimes it's, you know, an abomination like, um, you know, that Johnny Depp, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory disaster, you know, <laughs> like, let's just forget that ever happened. You know, <laughs> don't show that to children. Uh, Neil, were you in a production of Little Women one time? I don't want to talk about it. OK, you don't want to talk about it at all. No, I mean, we've already talked about it more than okay, I had a stage bit. time on it. So we're going to move on. Not, not one time. <laughs> I think it's important that we don't skip over like Jane Austen films sure. when we yeah. talk about like historical dramas or comedies, because I feel like those are the the best. Those are also ones that are remade constantly. And um, and they do like modern retellings of these stories and they're all really great. You know, some stories are just timeless, you know. It's true. And so that actually kind of segues into our next uh, subgenre anyways, which are romantic dramas. Um, do you think that if we look at, you know, we look at Pride and Prejudice and we look at um, what, what else has Jane Austen done? Um, Emma wasn't her, was it? Yep. It was. Emma. Was Emma. Austen. Yeah. Um, Emma. Yeah. Was it Sense and Sensibility. Was that, oh, was that Oliver? No, that's Sense and, yeah, Sense and Sensibility. And then she did. Okay. Um, Northanger Abbey. That's right. Persuasion. Uh, so are, are all of those, would you guys consider all, all of those, all Jane Austen, would that also be period romances or historical romances? Or would would that fall into one of those cross genres where it's also a romantic drama? Okay, yeah, a sure. lot of her were, it wasn't all what or you would consider. Then, whatever. I mean, right. And it's not all what you would consider romance. Of course, uh, almost every story out there probably has an element of romance, whether it's whether it's direct or indirect. Right. But when it comes to how they make those movies of as far as Pride and Prejudice and Emma and all of them go, I think it's how it's done that, sure. that brings a lot to it. Like, would you consider something like Clueless to be a period piece? Because Clueless no. is just a retelling of Emma. Right. So, it, as I said, it all depends on how it's done. Sure. Well, I mean, I think all of uh, anybody that wrote back then would all have period pieces because unless they were writing a futuristic romance, uh, you know, I don't think Jules Verne wrote any romance novels. Um, to my knowledge. But I, I think they would all definitely fall into the period. Um, and I think that uh, like Jane Austen, um, you know, a lot of hers are you have a lot of comedic elements in it. Um, Oscar Wilde uh, is probably my favorite uh, 
playwright from that era. Um, and the importance of being earnest is one of my absolute favorite, um, fantastic period point. romantic yeah. comedy pieces. Yeah. Uh, it's very clever, very clever. Indeed. Clever girl. I might recommend it at the end of the show. We'll see. You might. I don't know. I'll, but uh, in case it was going to be Neil's pick, I'll let him go first. Oh, it, just... Neil, are you picking the importance of being earnest? I wasn't, but I might now. <laughs> do it. Do it, dude. Sock it to Gary. Take him back. Um, so a lot of the from what I was from what I had been reading recently, it, it looked like romantic drama or dramas had become a subgenre on its own due to almost due to the fact that these were the kind of the the highest award winning types of because really there's there's a lot of drama in in, in a lot of romances. You know, it's it's like if you I don't know what other genre would cross over with drama really easily. Johnny, would you say that for romantic dramas that Die Hard is a romantic drama? Oh, absolutely. No. It's not it's not a Christmas movie, but it's certainly a romantic drama. <sighs> <Damn it. laughs> no, Gary, I would not say it's a fucking Just, romantic I'm drama. I'm tearing this podcast apart. <laughs> Go ahead, Jess. I think we need to just like we need to take Die Hard and we need to leave it alone. Okay. It's just a it's just a movie by itself, regardless of what we think. Okay. Well, <sighs> we've we've been arguing about this this well, I've been arguing with everybody about it not being a Christmas movie for I feel like two months at this point. It's not a fucking Christmas movie. I'm you sorry. Am I allowed? A Christmas movie in one of the podcasts. I was doing it as a joke. No, you were not. Yes, I was. I can play that back. I, I will insert it. Can't fight the clip. Insert it. All right, Johnny. All right. Visitors do not respect the guest list at a Christmas party in an L.A. office building, and one of the executive's husbands <laughs> is not happy about it. Die Hard. Nice. Very good. Nice. Best Christmas movie ever. Just Best heads up. Best Christmas movie of all time. <laughs> Die Hard. Nice. Very good. Nice. Best Christmas movie ever. Nice. Best Christmas movie ever. Yeah. I can just let everybody know, guys, Gary has become a master post-audio mixer, and he has combined different words that I have said from different no, podcasts this is into wrong. one this is a segmentated false statement piece. you're hearing one, right now. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an incorrect line that I never said. So, Gary, just put it in. And I'm going to put the raw audio in. Raw. How do, people know it's raw. raw. How do people know it's raw? Exactly. You have no way to prove it. You have no way of proving that it's not. <laughs> I will, I will upload, upload the raw audio clip. You'll upload a picture of you going YouTube. through the raw audio files. <laughs> <by bit. laughs> um, so anyways, but so for, I guess there, you know, drama kind of just comes hand in hand with romance. It's typically a, one of the, I guess it's typically one of the subplotted genres in, in a romantic film. Um, but from the movies that I had gone through, dr- um, a lot of those dramas, you saw things like the English patient, <laughs> sorry, uh, Titanic, We'll get into that in a second. Uh, Things along those lines. Casablanca also fell into that. Pride and Prejudice fell into it. The Notebook fell into it. Um, Atonement. uh, What do we think we had? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was something I came across. Um, Things things of that nature. Yeah, and and a lot of you you see a pretty common theme with that is there a lot of them are award winners or you know nominations at least. Um, So I kind of wanted to talk about some of the the top films out of that out of that grouping. Um, I, I gotta, I gotta jump to Titanic. I, I have to, I am going to let whoever actually finds that movie to be one of the best romances and best films ever made to jump in and, and defend it and say something about it before I go to town. So would anybody like to jump in Jess or Gary, maybe Neil? I have no idea. Is it true? Love means freezing, like saving your partner's inter- internal organs. If you're both going to have frostbite, lose your legs, that's fine. But you share the fucking board. That wasn't love. Yeah, you should. You should. It's it's her being <sighs> selfish. She's a self, she was being a selfish bitch. Like, that's what it was. She was. Scoot over. Scoot that's over, all I woman. Have to say. Scoot over, lady. You know, I don't know if he would do the same for her. He probably would. But, you yeah, know, who knows? I mean, he froze to death for her. But I, it wasn't love. They knew each other for what? A day and a half? If that. <sighs> 45 minutes? I made that up. That, that's all that it takes to know somebody in love. 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Um, I, I think the Titanic was a really good movie. I think that it was, uh, aside from just the cinemata- cinematography of it and how it was shot and sure. written and everything, but just in, in aspects of the love story, that was probably right. one of its weaker portions. But mm-hmm. you at least see that, you know, the, there's character there and that they try and like... that what the storyline is driven by? Isn't it supposed to be so a romantic drama? Like, is, is the, the romance story supposed to be what drives it? You're saying that's the weak, the one of the weaker points. Doesn't that in turn make it a weak film? Well, well back in the day, kiddos, uh, 
movies used to come on VHSs and Titanic would Sometimes come on, two. on a two set VHS. And I would always just pop in the second VHS for Titanic. When I, was <laughs> I mean, that's when it, it gets because, good. Yeah. So um, I will. And <laughs> Is that your favorite part, Neil, the last half hour? Well, it's right Our after it, it strikes the iceberg. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah of and course. It's, it just starts sinking. So um, people start dying. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just all these people flying overboard. Yeah, that's the most entertaining part. Sorry, Gary. So, yeah, I mean, like it, it's not the strongest love story, but I, I think it does a a suitable job. Okay. I can I can certainly point to a lot of other movies that have a much weaker love story. I okay. hate sand; it gets everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so if 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 that's if that's the case, you're just saying it's a it's a very good movie. Would you put it in the top ten or twenty best overall films of all time? Not your favorite, just top 10 or 20 you know it, it's become such a staple of culture and you know it's known so well maybe not as well as it used to be but i, I would say that um i wouldn't put it in my top 20 favorite films but i would say that it is well done i think you know james cameron pretty much always does an excellent job when he's filming anything like it's okay. always always a multi-billion dollar picture when he does it well that's just because he gets the budget for it i mean all right. Okay. Avatar, come on. Really? Yeah, I didn't like Avatar. Oh, James, was Cameron, kind of weird. James Cameron's a, an incredibly talented director. He's sure. a mediocre screenwriter. Um, right. he, he kind of like takes the archetypes of people and writes the characters that way, which right. I think is what he did with the characters. So, I mean, it was a solid movie. Um, it was mm -hmm. romantic. It was sad. It was yeah. action packed. It He's was well acted. Those, it hit it, a lot of it, those. It was a moment yeah, for our generation. Mm -hmm. You know, we were all in our teens or early adolescence, and it was a big deal when right. it came out. But I wouldn't right. put it on like a top on any of my lists. I don't think. Sure, and the reason that I the reason I bring it up is you know it it's it tied for the most. Oscar wins of all time. Now, granted, I'm sure with all of us between, you know, the Lord of the, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, Ben-Hur and the original and uh, Titanic. I don't think any three of those would fall into anybody's top five favorite films of all time. Return of the King, I would Return say. of the King is my six, seven. You know, it's it's closest for me. But Jess, sorry, go ahead. I think a lot of people really love. I mean, I don't think Ben-Hur is on many people's lists. Any. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, it, it's probably on somebody's, but yeah, I think a lot of people really like Lord of the Rings, and I think a lot of people really like Titanic. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't think, I don't, I just, I don't personally, I don't. You know think what? Movies involve movies on hmm. about boats, movies on boats. <laughs> it'd be on my list of boat movies. Movies, movie, movies located, movies based on the ocean. Yeah, okay. on the Would ocean. Jaws be number one. No, no. What would it would be, be on one? there too. It would be a boat film yeah, that I would your, put. Your favorite, your favorite nautical film would be. Yeah, that's right. That's what I should say. It sounds a little more it sounds silly. It sounds silly. intelligent. But yeah. Anyways, um, Michael, what do you think? Where are you at with that? As far as Titanic itself, um, yeah. I mean, just do you think? I mean, do you? Th I know we'll get to overrated romances in a second, but this one is just kind of the, at the pinnacle of romantic dramas, at least from the list that we've looked at. Right. So I can say I was entertained when I watched Titanic. Mm -hmm. and I was very much like Gary and Neil. I skipped right to that second VHS whenever that came out way back in the day. But and I think it was even James Cameron who said it, too, that he said, I'm doing an action film that's disguised as a romance movie. So Did he say that? Yeah, okay. I'm pretty oh, sure that was said that. in one of the interviews and that that was kind of the the driving force behind it. Right. So I don't necessarily know if the romance was always the first thing in his mind when he was making that film, but I also don't think it was terrible. Like it, okay. it, it, it stands up. And I think if they released it today, it would still get a huge audience and it would yeah, still win absolutely. a lot of awards. And I think that that probably says something. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Neil, where are you at with that one? I'm curious on everybody's take on this one. I mean, I enjoyed it. I've watched it a handful of times. It's it grossed a lot of money when it came out, uh, even years after. I think they re-released it. It still made money. Uh, I do think it's a great movie, but I mean, for me, it's you know not the romance story that interests me. Yeah, I think what I think what always turned me off 
to it so much was also the hype that it got when it came out. But the fact that what Gary mentioned, the weakest part of it is the relationship between uh, Jack, Jack and, and Rose and Rose. Thank you. I was going to say Scarlet. Sorry. And Rose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the fact that and Jess, you know, we were joking about her being selfish, but throughout the course of the movie, she constantly is being selfish. Like she doesn't she doesn't stand up for him. Well, she, she doesn't. That's how she grew up. I mean, that the, her part of the story was that she learned to be unselfish. But doesn't doesn't true love. Yeah, that's true. Gary. Break all molds. Thank you. Doesn't true love. What isn't true love supposed to break all molds? If if. If the meaning of oh, true I, love is to break through, sorry, go ahead. Johnny, what? you're old enough to be cynical and know the truth. All I that's don't, bullshit. It's not, no, even, point it's is, not necessarily cynicism. Mm -hmm. It's not, I think it's cynicism, but I think uh, you don't, a good love story will, I like, I like stories that feel real, you know, right. and it's not easy to to be in a relationship and, and there are lots of, um, you know, external factors. So and, I, and, and what I was guess, she supposed to do? I mean, I don't know. Like you said, I mean, there's, within, room, there's, there's room on the board. I mean, if she, she's going to be safe, no matter what she does, if she stands up for him and, and, you know, and tells the truth and, you know, begs what Billy Zane and, um, she would to be safe. <laughs> Billy Zane was an abusive person. She would have been safe enough. He wasn't going to kill her or anything. Well, he would have he would have beat her. I mean, that was definitely implied. That yeah, was it was, certainly, it was certainly implied, but I think she would have been safe enough. My, my point is that a movie like this is trying to portray the pure essence of romance, pure essence of true love. And if the pure essence of by our society's definition of true love is breaking all boundaries, breaking all stereotypes, breaking all molds, meaning that someone from the upper class and someone from the lower class can fall in love because they're soulmates, then that's just how it should be. And I, I don't think this film did a very good job of showing that. I, I just thought that I, the weakest part of the movie, I agree with you, Gary, was that. And because of that, I think it is the most overrated, not only romance film, but movie of all time. In, interestingly oh. enough, when it comes to Titanic, I think it's kind of a misconception that it's supposed to tell this great love story between Jack and Rose and that they were meant to be together, that she was always secretly in love. They were supposed to be soulmates and mm -hmm. he was ripped away from her and da, 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 da. Because uh, remembering the, the movie itself, and uh, I'm sure that could probably be an episode all by itself as <laughs> us going back and forth about this. But Rose came from a situation where she was part of what could be considered an aristocratic family, that the family sure. had certain things that they had to live up to and everybody had expectations. One of her expectations was that she was going to marry well. So that way the family estate, the family name, the legacy could continue on. It's very likely that she was being forced into that relationship. Oh, right. Absolutely. It's totally obviously agree. not something that she got along with. He was abusive. He felt like he owned her, that she was supposed to do anything he said, that sort right. of thing. So a lot of the story is less about the romance and more about her rebellious nature when it comes to trying to break out of the mold of of being somebody in an aristocratic family, mm -hmm. especially a young person in the early 1900s, when that idea young of... Woman. Right. And that, right. that's another big fact of it, too, is is that empowering moment of like, you don't own me. So right. I think that's that's where the movie more so lies than it lies in the great romance, because after Titanic, she goes on. She has a husband. She has right. children. She has grandchildren. <laughs> she goes on to have an entire life. But for this tryst that she had on a boat in her rebellious time of I, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do because it's wrong. That's kind of it fits the mold. I, I, f I feel like if that was the route that they were going for, that they failed to go that route. I, I don't feel do? that she was. Re I don't feel that she was rebellious enough. If that's the way they were going to if they were going to convey it, then I, I, I don't I feel that they failed on that aspect as well. I mean, I think I think the reason that I. I yeah, I mean, I, I have to disagree with you, Johnny, because I think that the relationship more than anything was very impactful in her life and not because it was some true love, but because it was this catalyst for her to escape a life that she didn't want it. Didn't if want. That, if that was the case, then why didn't James Cameron spend more time with her character? I mean, they spent a lot of time giving Jack's backstory almost as much time as they gave her backstory. So I don't, 
I, I get what you guys are saying, and I totally understand. Like, if that, I could, I could see that being an element to that. I don't think that they did it. If that's if that's the way you want to go, I think they did. I still think they did a very weak job of portraying that because they should have concentrated more on her as opposed to splitting time equally between her and him. Yeah, I mean, I just think ultimately James just, Cameron I mean, was I mean, trying to create some drama around the sinking of the Titanic. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, had the movie. Yeah, I mean, if the movie had just been about the sinking of the Titanic, uh, that could have been interesting. I don't, I don't know if they just if they if it wasn't a romance, it was just, you know, this historical reenactment of how the the captain fucked up. And <laughs> so uh, one last thing on the Titanic, uh, if you go onto YouTube now, you can put an alternate ending oh to God. Titanic. Yes. Uh, and oh, it's, gold. It's, it's it's really it a gold, weird man. moment because it's much different than the movie ends in, uh, in the theatrical version. <laughs> I mean, uh, my God, can you imagine if they... If that is the ending, <laughs> it's absurd. Oh, she tosses the diamonds into the air. Oh yeah, people need to to watch it immediately. It's very it's important. Like, it, it is pretty damn good. Um, so uh, we could we could sit here talking about Titanic all day. It's a uh, it's certainly a controversial one. Um, but I, I wanted to jump into really quick, uh, one that I hope we all equally hate. Um, the English Patient. That was another one that was up on my list. That that was one that I was just absolutely floored when it won. Um, it was the same like when uh when Crash won in the early two thousands. I was just like, what? Uh, not uh, not the same type of movie, obviously, but it won Best Picture for why? Why? It's just you you take the life of a guy that could have potentially been exciting, and then he tells his life story, and it's just the as slow as possible. And I just wanted to wanted him to die i felt like elaine in the seinfeld episode where you know peterman takes her to the to go see it like for a second or third stop time telling your story and just <laughs> die, <laughs> die. <laughs> i just i felt like that i mean i've seen the movie two or three times over the years just you try to give it a second chance and it's just it was like with lincoln you know the daniel day lewis steven spielberg one they took one of the most boring parts of the president's life and then tried to tell an entire movie around it and it's just and they and they made it slow too and it's just like can you speed up the pace a little bit can you can you have can you have ripples in the plot line is that is that okay um i don't, I don't know thoughts lincoln, on that lincoln was an excellent movie lincoln was not an excellent movie <laughs> daniel day lewis was fantastic I think sometimes a slow paced movie works. Um, I have a hard time getting through the English patient. I think Anthony Minghella is a really talented director and I really mm. love cold mountain. Like that's the movie I watched when mountain I was good when I have the flu or something. I'm like, it's, I'm just going to lay here and watch cold mountain. Cause it's three hours long. Um, <laughs> and it's amazing. Do so I don't, yeah. you know, he's a very talented director and was well acted. It's just a little, it's a little boring. Right. Right. Very um, boring. Hard to I, get through. Anybody here? Anybody here enjoy it? It's cool if you do. I'm just anybody here a fan? Michael, I don't know. Neil, any, Gary, I don't know. Gary, I think you, I, you we've talked about this before. I think you hated it as much as I did. Yes, it was nice to see Voldemort die, though, at the end of it. <laughs> I wish he had just been Voldemort the entire time. That would have been a little more interesting. Um, I. Like I could have, he could have, I, I don't know. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Uh, Your take on that movie. He should have been Voldemort the whole time. <laughs> it should have just been Harry Potter spinoff. That would have made it a little more entertaining, I suppose. Uh, let's, let's, speaking of uh, spinning off, let's go ahead and jump through uh, to the one that I think we're all the most interested to talk about, rom-coms. Jumping into rom-coms. Uh. Um, this is the famous mixture of romance and comedy and, They've had rom-coms since the beginning of cinema. They've had rom-coms starting in the 30s and all the way up until now. Um, I just I want to hear from you guys on a couple of your favorites, a couple of the classics. I have an opinion. I, I, I think there's a greatest romantic comedy. I can say okay. this with confidence because I watch. Sure. I love rom-coms, so I see even the really, really bad ones I will mm -hmm. watch. Um, but there's one that's just like chef's kiss. Perfect. It's the script is just flawless. Mm -hmm. um, and that is When Harry Met Sally. Oof. Um, yeah, baby. We were just talking about that outside earlier, actually. It is just so good. And I and I think that I think it's flawless. I mean, the script, Nora Ephron's script is, is just perfect. I've watched it, you know, uh, too many times to count. Um, and it's something that I can watch over and over again. And just it's just so good. Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal. 
perfect, just perfect. It's amazing. Carrie Fisher's in there. She sure is. Yeah, she is. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, and honestly, I think that's kind of a, a common misconception that I think it's just a stereotype that guys don't like rom-coms. I mean, a lot of rom-coms are, are pretty fucking funny, you know? Uh, they are. And I, I mean, I, I personally, I mean, I, I, you mentioned when Harry met Sally, you know, um, that's a fantastic one, you know, um, some like it hot. Uh, I, that's always been just one of my favorite movies in general. Um, uh, 50 first dates. That's probably in my top three of favorite Adam Sandler films. You guys know how much I love Adam Sandler. Um, Gary, what, Gary, what about you? I know, I know rom-coms are one of your favorite genres. Well, yes. Um, for me, uh, I think the, the best duo in rom-coms are always going to be Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, oh, yeah. who, uh, did I, I think they did nine movies together. Not all rom-coms though. They had a couple, uh, they had a couple drama, they had a couple some romantic them, yeah, dramas in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, like Adam's rib desk set, you know, really uh, good. they, they just, they really had a good chemistry together. And I think that's really important for on screen. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you've got males, probably my favorite, uh, modern rom-com. It's a classic. Um, I've probably seen that movie, more than 200 times really and, yeah <laughs> I, I can I holy can, crap man i didn't know it yeah. been that many uh, i think probably ghostbusters is the only movie i've seen more than that okay uh, but yeah i could at any point just start at any part of the movie and just continue the entire Recording. dialogue by myself and i often do yeah <laughs> um but yeah there's just so many great scenes in that and uh it's hard to say almost that that is a rom-com because it's Really? I, well, I mean, like, what's your definition? Because they're never you got together. Mail? Well, I say that's well, allow me to defend that statement because mm -hmm. they are never together in the movie until the, to the very end, right? They don't have to be together to have a relationship. But the well, they, relationship they did. Being formed. They were through email, right. through that's AOL. The relationship. Right, but it's never like they're not in a relationship together until like the very end when I wanted it to be you. I wanted it to be you so badly. Um, so it, it's more uh, a movie about longing and desire than it is like in a relationship. But I would still consider that to be rom com. Sure. Yeah, I don't know how specific we're getting. But do you, so would you not think so if you want to take away their relationship being so when I said when I said earlier when I was trying to preface the you know, You've got males a rom com. What, I don't I, think I agree. we should argue that. Well, here's what I'm here's what I'm saying to Gary is that um, they don't have to be in a relationship; they're forming a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. So even when they're meeting each other, uh, when they're actually meeting face to face, and they don't know they're talking to each other online, mm -hmm. they're creating that relationship first. They they're kind of neutral, and then they hate each other, and then we slowly start to see them become best friends and romantically involved, and the relationship is being. I mean, it's 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 manifesting into something romantic from the very beginning, you know, on both sides. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the I think, honestly, I think it's the epitome of a rom com. I, I think it's right there. Um, but that's just me. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's just me. also a Nora Ron script. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah, the rom coms Ron. one. Yeah. Amazing. I there was uh, another one that I, I I kind of I went back and forth between putting this as my number one and I put it as my number two um, mm -hmm. is Moonstruck with Cher and Nicolas Cage. Have any of you seen this movie? Another classic. Of course. Is, <laughs> I mean, come on. It's so good. It is so good. It's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, my, Michael, what about you? What's, uh, what's, which one do you think kind of still stands the test of time? What's one of your favorites? Uh, I'm with Gary that uh, I really enjoy You've Got Mail. Uh, there, there's a lot of, of great quotes, great scenes, just just able to play it over and over again. And and yeah, I, I'm still going to disagree with Gary. It is a rom com in my eyes, and it's not necessarily about being in the relationship and then the challenges that are presented in that relationship that make a rom com. It's more about the evolution right. of a relationship, how it can start out adversarial on one hand, but then friendly on another, and you face some you know, face some adversity and the, just kind of the ebb and flow until you finally come together at the end or don't, depending on the story. But You've Got Mail is a really good one. Um, Clueless was another one that yeah, I really yeah, enjoy. It uh, it's it's just fun. And that the, the Valley Girl aspect of it is always fun to quote and go back and forth with. Uh, Splash, mm. uh, Daryl Hannah, Tom Hanks, that was 1984. That's another really good one. Um, and then a recent a uh, recent addition to this bunch that I really like is Easy A. Yeah. With Emma Stone. One. Like, I think mm -hmm. that's, it's a great play on the romantic comedy because 
the you know 95 percent of that movie is the buildup of her having to explain the backstory of why she's going to you know end up really loving this guy and it all starts with a lie from the very get-go and then she has to explain lie after lie after lie and all the way until the end when she's like and that's why we're together see ya <laughs> and there we go <laughs> uh neil what about you what's what's one of your what's one of your favorites one that you think uh we should still be watching to this day I mean, I think my all-time favorite rom-com is probably going to be The Wedding Singer. Um, oh, yeah. It's just classic Adam Sandler, Drew Barrymore. Um, that's a go-to for me. I know Susanna, that's probably her top movie ever. Yeah, uh, it's a good movie. <laughs> it's her. a good one. So that's that's usually my go-to when it comes to rom-coms. It's, fu- it's funny because you don't think of, when we think of romance stars, you know, we think of we think of the leading heartthrobs as being always going to be in the, the, the poster boys of, or the poster children of, of what we're going to see. But, you know, come on here, Adam Sandler, like the guys, when had some I think of romance, rom-coms. Go ahead. when I think about romance, I'm like, give me Adam Sandler, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I was about to say that, that I think that, and, and I, I could be wrong here and I may not be the authority to, to be, speaking on this but i think that idea that the lead or the the uh, the person that you're going to be attracted to has to be a heartthrob right. or has to be somebody who it wouldn't society would see as being like an attractive person right i think that when it comes to stories like that people will find attraction in a lot of different things whether it's a sense of humor a personality a caring nature Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily all about the looks and i'm not saying that that looks don't hurt anything they definitely do i mean if it's quasimodo being charming to you but then again (laughs) think about that statement they fell in love with quasimodo and he's not necessarily the most attractive guy on the block or at the bell tower as it were I mean, it's 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 nice to be able to have a leading man or a leading woman that is relatable to, you know, I mean, you know, the top five percent of people in the world that actually look like a young Leonardo DiCaprio or young Brad Pitt or whatever. That, that's why Margot I always like Meg Ryan in my romance movies, because she was like hot, but like I felt attainable. No. Kind of with and same thing with like a Tom Hanks or something like that. Yeah. Like, like I, oh, Tom I, Hanks is a decent yeah. looking I feel dude. Like if I really yeah, tried, I can get Tom Hanks, guy, yeah. average looking lady. Um, yeah, and I, th- I think I think that's fair. Same thing with like an Adam Sandler and a Drew Barrymore. You're like, huh? Neither of these people are. They're not ugly people. I'm not saying, but they're they're an average looking bunch. You know, they're like, okay, I, I could see my I could envision myself there. You know, or envision going after them and and it being attainable for sure. Um, and I think the reason that everybody just loves rom-com so much is because they they take sure the romantic aspect of it which everybody loves a tiny romance in a movie even an action movie they have romance there's always a romantic interest you know horror movies there's typically a romantic interest whatever and then you add half of the entire thing is a comedy and you just combine two of the best genres into one that's why they're so damn popular well i i I think it's because and like you see this in in music as well like probably 90 5% 5% of songs that are written are love songs or have some aspect of love because that's just such a key element to to what a, being a human is, you know, to have, uh, you know, uh, you know, romance with a, a partner. Um, and I, I think that that's why that's so embedded. You That's why it's really hard to do, you know, talk about romance movies because you've got rom-coms, you've got drama, 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 um, drama, yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got like <laughs> horror movies that have romance in them. Like in every uh, genre, you're going to have romance sprinkled in it. Like, I can't think of like, can you even think of a movie that doesn't have a romance or a, or something like that in it. It's hard. Star Wars episode. Yeah. Two. The Exorcist. <laughs> the Exorcist. Yeah. I guess a few horror movies. Yeah. Would certainly fall into <laughs> fall under the like list. me. <laughs> like me. Jesus. dude. That was pretty good. Gary. Good job. Uh, so, so, so moving on to probably this, honestly, if you think about it, we hear of chick flicks all the time. We hear about them. But if you really look at it, what movie solely constitutes themselves as a as a chick flick? I mean, is, I think isn't it's about a, you know, marketing, for, right? You know, right, like towards women. Okay, we're gonna... No, I was just going to say that's the thing is you're you're right. It's a genre, a subgenre that's predominantly marketed towards women. But then again, aren't 
most romances supposedly marketed towards all women. I think m- most chick flicks guys, you know, guys can watch and enjoy just as much as yeah. you know, women can. I'm, I'm trying to think of like a movie that's like a chick flick flick that I was just like, this is terrible. Like the Phantom Thread. That wasn't like, a chick flick. That's a straight up drama. Well, it was it was not enjoyable to me. But like, Paul Thomas Anderson has been pretty damn weak over the last decade. I'll yeah, give you that. he really has. He's fallen um, off a lot for me, at least. I think just the term chick flick may refer to movies that are driven by the, the the romance of the story rather than maybe the comedy of it or the action of it. Um, so I don't really think that that's exclusive to women, you know. Okay. But no. he, but predominantly, we'd say that the majority of that audience would be women watching it. I, I don't know. I I watch a lot of chick flicks. I do too. I mean, I'm just I'm just saying if if that's what if that's what the definition of what a chick flick is, at least from what I've seen, is that yeah, it's a movie that's predominantly marketed towards women. So I'll give you a couple examples that I found online that I that I had written down here. So ones that I saw pop up that were really common. Uh, Dirty Dancing was one. The Notebook. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, the the '90s version, um, How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days. Um, even though I would consider that more rom com than anything else, um, but yeah, so those are the four most popular ones that I saw on a bunch of lists. What do you guys think about that? Um, Dirty Dancing, Jess. What do you think? Is that a chick flick, or where are we at with that? I don't. I mean, I want to get you know like political here, <laughs> but like I feel like gonna, there's so a little ahead. bit of. I feel like there's a little bit of, you know, sexism mixed in with that. Like I, it's, they're just movies and they might have a female lead and it might be telling a female story. Sure. Um, I don't know if I love the classification, you know, because sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's just a movie with a female lead telling right. a female story. I think a lot but of the stuff I that love they dirty had, dancing. Mm-hmm. You it's know? a great movie. I think a lot yeah. of the stuff they had brought up was the fact that, like you had said, it's a female lead in chick flick and, she's supposed to come in and she essentially it, the tables are reversed. The tables kind of turn and it's a little, it's, it's reversed sometimes where the woman kind of saves the man from himself kind of thing. We yeah. see that that's pretty common. Um, in, in all of those movies, actually, we, we see that that is a common theme. Um, I mean, I don't, yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of with you. I don't, I like all, I mean, all the, the Romeo and Juliet remake, I was kind of the on, but I mean, the other ones I'm, I, I, I enjoy them. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Michael, where are you at with that? I think Jess is probably, you know, I would probably agree with Jess on on certain aspects of that. I think a lot of it has to do with with marketing and with with how they think, OK, how are we going to best sell this to try to get the audience that we feel like is going to be the strongest for it? Sure. If we give it a label like chick flick or we, you know, put pink on the poster, or we do all of these things that in their mind is going to to better market it towards a certain demographic. That's what they're going to do. There are plenty of guys out there who really like Dirty Dancing. There are plenty of guys out there who really really like what would be considered the traditional chick flick movies. Um, I just think it may not be, I guess, in their eyes, socially acceptable, quote unquote, for them to claim that they like them publicly. Right. Um, Whether that's because of external influence or internal influence is a whole huge debate. But I I think it just is. I would definitely agree with her. Yeah. Gary, what do you think? I like Dirty Dancing. I think that's a great, great movie. Um, I think that it is the. line nobody puts baby in a corner is kind of stupid you know it doesn't really make a lot of sense uh, yeah it, but, it is a little it's yeah. a cool line to say though yeah if you I think mean, about yeah, it like it's yeah. just it's just an awesome line but to that's quote, just where right. she sat right then anyway yeah. um uh, <laughs> it has metaphorical reference but we'll get into that later <laughs> I, I mean like yeah i don't think that uh chick flicks or guy flicks i mean like there are because some the movies, that, action movies yeah. like that's uh, normally, but pl- there are tons of women that love action films. I know yeah. tons of women that love action I, films. I don't think people are as demarcated as the marketing, at least in Would the like 70s believe. and the 80s used to sure. think that they were. I, right. The most manliest man movie I can think of is probably like Commando. You always say Commando. I like and, keep going. It's well, good. I mean, that's just like to me the ultimate like action flick. Sure. Except for Die Hard, of course. But yeah. you won't let us talk about that. No, no, no. I won't. Um, so like, you know, I, I there are people like of all ages and races and genders, you know, that you know, like Commando. You know, I mean, so I, I yeah, or they I don't think, think it's ridiculous. You know what I mean? Or, or it's thing, a sliding yeah. scale. <laughs> yeah, it's a great I, movie, but yeah. you, can, you can be wrong. It's okay. <laughs> so, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't think that chick flicks is really, uh, a definition that yeah. fits really. It's kind of just an out, it's kind of an outdated term at this point, you know? I mean, yeah. it, I, I think we can all agree if a, if a story in a film is compelling and it's enticing and it's got solid character arcs and the characters are somewhat relatable, I, I, that's, it, that's a makings of a good film. It doesn't matter what genre it is, you know? One of the most chick flick where movies that I think of when I would think of chick flick would probably be like the English patient, but I think we all hated it. And one of us is a chick. That's a chick flick. I wouldn't I think actually, I would never consider I, what the English I think patient of chick flick. What I think, think when so? people say chick Maybe. flick, I'm thinking of like Miss Congeniality, Legally Blonde, you really? know? Yeah. Legally, you know, is that the one with Reese Witherspoon? I still, she was in the yeah, yeah. I still yeah, consider yeah, those I just comedies because they're, because they're hilarious. That's, they're, but, but that's my point movies. is like, I don't think that they're that they there's really such a thing as chick flicks like yes right. more uh, you know statistically right if you we were to do a survey more men would probably enjoy john wick than females but there are a lot of women who like probably. that movie and yeah. more women are going to go see something like legally blonde but you know it's not but exclusive nowadays. to females sure. you know yeah it, it does seem a little it does seem a little outdated for sure um, so the last one that we had on the list, uh, was one that I had never even fucking heard of before, um, paranormal romance. And I, I feel like this is one that I feel like this is one that was just, I, I saw it in two different articles and I was like, you know what, I, I'm going to throw this in there. Cause I want to hear what everybody has to say about it. Um, the first thing that popped into my mind was, was the twilight saga. Um, just maybe it's cause it's been the most recent, um, of those, but it's, I mean, it's just, it's a. <laughs> It's a combination of romance and fantasy, essentially, or romance and horror. Um, so I, I don't really know why it's a subgenre. Um, but Michael, you had brought up a really good one earlier. Um, that newer zombie film that told the story of love relationship between a zombie and a this survivor of the apocalypse. Oh, warm bodies. Warm bodies. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess based on that definition of you said it's paranormal romance. Yeah, that's what I. That's a new one for me. Yeah, yeah. I had I had heard yeah, of it before. Supernatural romance, paranormal yeah, sure, romance. Supernatural that's romance. That's definitely a, a new one for me. I guess you'd you'd start putting things in that category, like like you said, Twilight, uh, Ghost may fit into sure, that. Sure, Ghost yeah. probably fit in there. Uh, although yeah. I would see that more as like a melodrama because it's <laughs> real sad. But it is. Um, yeah, Warm Bodies was was actually a really good movie and, and to be honest i always thought it was kind of a play on the rom-com uh -huh. because it's that that idea of a relationship developing building over time and then where it ends up at the end and seeing the adversity related and it's kind of that classic story of like people from two different sides of the railroad track sure. coming together it's yeah. just in this case the railroad track happens to be death and undeath i suppose yeah uh gary what about you do you have any that might fall into that category that uh that we don't talk about much or maybe some that just pop into your head that are there's classic. an episode of star trek the next generation no. called sub rosa <laughs> no no let's <laughs> let's leave let's leave exclusively movies tonight no tv series <laughs> so yeah like uh ghost is like the only i'm trying to think of like a a paranormal love story and what was that movie where they they were like writing each other love letters through their cat their ki their cabinets or something? What was, what was it? I, 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 there's there's someone here on this episode. Like, that that was the Lake Book. Oh the yeah, lake, yeah. Lake <laughs> oh, that, that was the was, Lake House. That was so, maybe one of the worst things that, was that a I've horrible, ever. That was a horrible film. Uh, Gary, you have a story about that, don't you? Gary wants to tell a story about uh, the lake house really quick that involves him and a, a friend of ours on the panel tonight. Uh, yes, uh, Michael was watching um, a movie that he called The Notebook. And uh, he's like, oh, this movie's terrible. And he was he was texting me. I was like, oh, yeah, what's happening? And then he's like, there's this little flag that keeps going up and down. And I was like, you ain't watching The Notebook. You're watching The Lake House. <laughs> and he's like, ah. <laughs> Oh, we find Look, so I get them mixed stupid. up sometimes. <laughs> the lake book. Oh. I guess that could be considered a, a paranormal romance. I mean, it has some I kind suppose. of fantasy element to it or some kind of science fiction element when it comes to time travel, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, guess, I, I say so. I sure. As a rule, I, Keanu Reeves is a national treasure. We love him, even though he's a very oh, bad true. actor. Um, we don't care. We love him. Um, but he shouldn't be a lead in a romantic film. Can we say that? I said it and I mean it. Maybe romance. I, I, yeah. I, th I liked hardball. I'm just saying hardball. It's a drama, but you know, and I mean, still good. 
I guess uh, Speed was more so considered an action movie, but yeah, it did have yeah. that yeah. romance element of it with him coming together yeah. with Sandra Bullock at the end. Yeah. Uh, but she was way too valuable to get in the second one, but I suppose Keanu Reeves was too. Oh, no, wait, it was Sandra <laughs> no, Bullock who was in the, the second, second one. Keanu wasn't Reeves didn't. That's right. That's right. Too much money. Too Speed much money. 2, colon, cruise control. <laughs> Willem Dafoe was in that movie. Willem I Dafoe. I yes, he was. He's He's My been God. in a lot of... One of those actors that's always in classics and then always in movies you just can't fucking stand. Uh, it, it, so any, anyways, the more we talk about supernatural romances and paranormal romances, I kind of think this is a stupid subgenre. Like I saw it in the two list and I was like, I'll give it a chance. And the more we're debating it and, and analyzing it, I just think that it's completely ludicrous that I've actually put that in chick flicks. I feel like that shouldn't even be. I feel like there's three subgenres of romances uh and the these other two should be completely excluded i think it should be historical romance romantic drama and rom-coms that's it what do you guys think should we get rid of chick flicks and, and paranormal romances it doesn't seem like it seems like one's an outdated term and one there's not enough of those types of films chick flicks i would definitely get rid of mm -hmm. i think that's kind of a, a term that needs to go back in the vault just to make any sense yeah out, because know? it's the same thing like you wouldn't say that's a guy flick or a guy film yeah it's it's kind of like outdated dick flick, dick flick. that's dick pretty flick. good yeah there's... it also sounds painful um <laughs> yeah why, why don't we call them dick flicks because it sounds just... painful i we could we could call the dick flick i'd be fine with that that's actually good i'm gonna funny. use that now i be like that looks like a dick flick i don't want to watch that i'm gonna use that i highly encourage everybody to start calling it <laughs> yeah. that. that's wonderful copyright let feather production yeah that's but... right you can't, you can't say every time you say it we get 25 cents right but yeah uh, I, I definitely think chick flick needs to go back in the vault I'm kind of intrigued, though, by this paranormal romance thing now, ever since you've mentioned it. I almost want to go and kind of try and do a little bit of research to say, OK, what movies could fall into this? So Was it something it. that they created a category just to create a category to feel special? Or is this really something that exists? Yeah. Because like I said, the only things I can think of are like warm bodies and ghosts. And that's it. Yeah. Like, you know, before we had this conversation today, I thought, yeah, chick flicks. Yeah. But after we discussed them, I don't really think anything really that's not a good demarcation not you know really it just yeah. doesn't it just doesn't hold up anymore well I, you know and i don't know if it like really like ever held up because i mean i know people like oh yeah my girlfriend's gonna go watch a chick flick with her friends but like a lot of those movies i like you same know? <laughs> yeah I think that's the thing i've i've never all the ones we mentioned i've i've never thought to myself god i just wasted two hours yeah. of my life like, and, i'm like oh it's pretty damn yeah, good and i don't yeah. think i've ever felt nervous or hesitant to be like should i say that i like this movie i know it's a chick flick so i mean like yeah, yeah it just it doesn't make any sense to me the whole premise of it yeah yeah absolutely uh jess what do you think do you think chick flicks uh, should and paranormal romances should go away or uh is uh is one of them here to don't, stay i don't have anything to contribute to paranormal romances right now i'm not really thinking of anything maybe I mean, all I could think of was the lake house. <laughs> and I hated that movie. You mean the lake book. Okay, right. Lake the book. note house. <laughs> the lake book. Oh, I'm going to use dick flick you so much now. Please use I dick just flick need all the time. To know that. You know, Hashtag I... Hashtag dick flick all your Facebook posts. <laughs> you know, like, I like indie movies. So I have, like, probably yeah. some of my favorite romantic films are are kind of weird and not super well known yeah main, but none mainstream. of them are paranormal okay. you know all right well i mean uh okay so general consensus is is chick flick should should retire for good and paranormal romances is we'll put it out to pasture for now but uh michael seems like he's gonna research it a little bit and and maybe we'll uh work our way back around to it uh, so I want to jump over to our last roundtable discussion of the night, which is uh, we're going to I want to go through just everybody's personal opinions on uh, best overall romances, most overall, most overrated romances and romances that we may have forgotten that we shouldn't have because they're just such classics. Um, so, Jess, I want to start with you because I know that uh, you came really prepared tonight. Um, give us one or a couple, it doesn't matter, of uh, some of the best romances or your favorites of uh, of all time. He mentioned When Harry Met Sally and Moonstruck, which is on my mm -hmm. list. We didn't talk about Say Anything, which is a movie mm. I've watched, you know, probably 150, 200 times. I can That's probably movie, recite is it? it. Is it not? Growing up, I mean, I think it, yeah, it, it's one of those movies, I guess you were talking about Gone with the Wind and 
there's like something comforting about watching it kind of how I feel about say anything you can put it on and um but also another favorite movie of mine which I'm pretty sure I'm the only person who's actually seen this movie in the world (laughs) I'm just kidding but it didn't it made like very little money at the box office when it came out and um was limited in theaters but I love it so much it came out like 1991 Mm. um it's called Dogfight, and it's starring River Phoenix and Lily Taylor. Lily Taylor from, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, what's that movie? The Haunted House movie. Damn it. Anyways. The Haunted um, Mansion with Eddie Murphy? Anyways, the premise of the movie is that he's this Marine who, him and his Marine buddies have this. It's set in the early 60s. Um, they have a annual event that they host called the dog fight and the rules of the dog fight are every Marine goes out and tries to find the ugliest woman to take to this party and whoever brings the ugliest date wins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it starts out with River Phoenix kind of walking around trying to find, you know, an unattractive lady. And then he meets this young girl who isn't really ugly, but she's just plain and a little bit, you know, overweight and just this sweet little girl in a diner. And he takes her to this dog fight and then drama happens and whatever, whatever. But the great part about the movie for me um, and what I appreciated about it so much when I was younger, especially um was kind of something you guys were talking about which is like adam sandler is a leading man you right. know or having somebody that was you know that looked like a real person in real life falling mm-hmm. in love i what i appreciated about it is these two people like she became more beautiful and amazing to him throughout the course of them getting to know each other but it isn't because she like took her ponytail out or got a makeover it was just because he got to know her and she was this amazing person um i love it, it so dangerously much. F- it sounds dangerously f- familiar almost uh, not exactly like but pretty close to uh pretty in pink i know he, they, they weren't judging the the girl on how she looked but uh, I, know, I have seen yeah. that movie you have yeah. i love it I so much i i um i also really like this movie called um wrist cutters which is <laughs> this movie <laughs> this about romance? jesus right. yes it is <laughs> it is it is a movie where the premise of the movie is when you commit suicide you go to this afterlife and it's like this mediocre version of oh. our life you know that's kind of the punishment for for committing suicide and these two people purgatory. meet okay. yeah but it's not it's not depressing at all it's really it's super interesting, super original storytelling. Actually does, that actually does very, sound very good. really interesting. Uh, it is really enough. good. You should you should check it out. Gary, excuse me. I wanted to jump to you next. Um, what what do you think is what's one of your favorites uh, as far as romance films go? Uh, well, we, we already talked about You've Got Mail. Right, I think so that's uh, one definitely one, one of the best. Um, but uh, my favorite film or story that has anything to do with romance is it was originally a play and then became a popular movie called Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, it's written by Edmund Rostand, a French playwright. If you don't, if you're not familiar with it, it's, you probably know aspects of it. Like it's got, uh, the guy with the long nose and, uh, he stands in the bushes while the handsome guy talks to, uh, Roxanne tries to woo her and he kind of walks her through that. Um, mm-hmm. and it's just a really excellently written piece of artwork i think and that would be my favorite uh romantic movie okay you know for me i i just for me there's there's two one is more recent um then i'm sorry but the the newest version of a star is born i probably saw that in theaters with vanessa uh four or five times Mm -hmm. i would say altogether. um and it's not just the soundtrack was awesome uh i i was not a fan of the Chris Christopherson and Barbara Streisand version. Uh-huh. Um, I had seen that when I was a little younger and I, I, I was a little put off by that experience. So I was like, all right, well, this is, you know, my thing, if it's nominated for an Oscar, I'll, I'll, I'll go see it just so we can make it into a competition at the Oscar party every year. Um, and I saw it and I, I was just blown away by the performances and the changes that they had added into the script. And I know the general plot was still, you know, pretty much the same. 
um, but they changed a lot of key aspects in the characters' arcs, and I appreciated that. Made them more made them more human. It made them made them more relatable to me. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was, man. Maybe it was the sexual chemistry between Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga that I, I love too. But uh, I just thought it was so well done for Bradley Cooper's directorial debut. Um, he, I thought he hit it out of the park. But my favorite has always been The Notebook. Um, I'm sorry, but if you're just gonna go. That's just the hopeless romantic in me from, you know, if if you're going to go just straight up classic romance, I can't I can't think of. I can't think of another script that I would just straight up sit down and read, let alone watch the movie multiple times um, to make me feel like that. That's that's true love, man. No matter what happens, that that is what Titanic was trying to do, but failed at. And the notebook got right Two people on opposite ends of the spectrum who found each other, knew they were soulmates um, and and found a way to make it work. You know, even though it, even if it was years and years later, they still found each other and. And the fact that, you know, Noah waits until the very end, until Allie is safe. That was his one goal in life is to make sure that his one true love was safe at the very end. And she had the best life possible. And that was her goal as well. And it was just a mutual partnership. You know, they 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 bickered a ton, but they loved each other. And it was just a timeless story. Anyways, I'll uh, I'll, I'll gush all day. But those those are my those are my favorites. Um, Michael, what about you? Alrighty, so yeah, we've already kind of mentioned some of the ones that are really my favorites as far as you've got mail. Um, I'd mentioned Splash earlier. That's always a really good one. And then Clueless. Uh, I think Clueless, honestly, though, I think may be more of a nostalgia thing for me than anything else. Oh, yeah. Um, that I 90s. Can, yeah. yeah. The 90s, I remember it coming out. Um, just, just all the kind of that fun aspect to it. But one of my favorite movies that has a romance element to it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of controversial to call it a romance movie because that's not necessarily what it is, um, is actually Edward Scissorhands. Okay. And I know this sounds crazy because it's more of a fantasy movie than anything else, but a large romance. romance. And this may end up falling into that category (laughs) because, you know, a large chunk of that movie is based on him, one, learning how to be a, whatever he is, whether he's a human being or whether he's, you know, a fake person or undead, whatever you want to call it. Um, But a lot of it is the romance that begins to blossom between him and Winona Ryder Mm -hmm. within the movie. And just that, that, that back and forth of what is love? What isn't love? What are these feelings? How do I express these feelings? Oh God, I have scissors for hands. (laughs) It's just really weird. It's a hundred percent Tim Burton, Mm -hmm. but there's something about it that's really captivating to me. And it's not that traditional romance, right? It's it's not easy dialogue and and a little bit of adversity here and there. See them show up together in the end or, you know, break apart because of the adversity. This is something completely different. And I think it's just really interesting to watch a relationship like that blossom on stage and try and figure out where the hell is this going to go? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the that's the exciting part of, of of any good script of any good film of I have no idea how this is going to end up or I kind of do. But how the fuck are they going to get there? Right. <laughs> and how do you survive with scissors for hands? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just and it's so how do you have there. sex, guys? I just want right. to know like, it's, yeah, yeah, without hurting her. How, how do I do it? <laughs> it's just so out there. And it's again, it's it's Tim Burton, the dude fucking weird to begin with. And you can come up with these ideas and, and put these things on screen that. No one, you know, they they talk about you put enough uh, monkeys in a room and give them enough time. They can write Shakespeare. I don't think they could write Edward Scissorhands, to be 100 percent honest with you. Would Beetlejuice classify as uh, paranormal romance between uh, Alec Baldwin and uh, Gina Davis? I don't think so. Because I don't think that was the central part of the story. Yeah, right. And and I will say that in Edward Scissorhands, their relationship wasn't necessarily the central part of the story. It was more an aspect of him learning how to be a person. But that contributed to it happening. It it did. And I think in Beetlejuice, um, Alec Baldwin and uh, Gina Davis's relationship was already there. Mm -hmm. And the only thing they were going through was just a transition in their relationship from living to dead. But it wasn't changing how they felt about each other. It wasn't changing their love. It was just, okay, how do we continue to go on like this now that we're dead? And how do we get these people out of our house? Yeah. But but that's a good question either way, Gary, um, because it, 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 it makes you ask yourself, yeah, what really what constitutes as a primary romance 
you know, or what constitutes primarily as a comedy, even though there's a lot of romantic elements or aspects in the film itself. Um, so it's fun to debate. It's always it's always a, a fun topic. So really quick, though, I want to run through everybody. I, give me give me just one. Um, what films you think are overrated romances? And I know we kind of already discussed a couple of them earlier. Um, feel free to repeat if those are the ones at the top of your list. Um, but let's start with Gary on this one. Well, I I would say for a romance, the most overrated film is definitely Titanic. I mean, I, I don't think there's like okay. that was, you know, if you were old enough to remember the mid to late 90s, uh, everybody saw Titanic and was like, oh, this is the best romance oh, ever. I'm not saying it was bad. I just I think it's definitely the most overrated, though. Yeah. I can't think of another movie that I'm like, that's what everybody says is a love so story. Overhyped. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Jessica, what about you? I would say Pretty Woman. <laughs> um, what? Really? Yeah, man. I okay. I, right. I just have a lot of issues with it now. I used to love it, but I watch it now and I'm like, Richard Gere's character, like he gives off some like Jeffrey Epstein vibes, like <laughs> like prostitutes. That was That's not the experience that they have. I think the original script was much more serious and... It's just all of it is just kind of cringeworthy to me rewatching it. You know, I just don't I don't see the appeal. OK. All right. Got to be honest with you. See that that. Yeah. OK. All right. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. To me, that that uh, that type of story still falls into what I think the what I think the the true classic of a romantic story should be is people from different sects of life coming together and and finding each other and realizing they should be together regardless of how they grew up and the adversities that they faced or how easy their life was or whatever and just right. knowing and I, we're meant to be i think and those types of that's stories the, that's the are great too i think those types of stories are great too but i think it's important to maybe paint a more realistic picture of uh, it's just there's no basis in reality at all in that and i just i just didn't i just didn't think it aged well Hey man, sometimes for movies you gotta suspend belief. So, but yeah, okay, fair, fair enough. I mean, I, I totally do see your point, um, Michael. What about you? Most overrated romance. I've always felt this way. It's Romeo and Juliet. Okay, it is so overrated. And here's the thing: it's not a bad story. It's not. I mean, it's, it's Shakespeare. Who am I to to try to criticize the work of Shakespeare? Right. Lots of it's, critics have done it over the last couple centuries. They so have, you wouldn't be the first. I, I would not. You know. Uh, I would not put myself as some of the greatest critics of the past century to be able to do that. <laughs> but what I will say is that Romeo and Juliet is played up to be something more than it is. Right. And and I think ultimately that's where my my like, oh, that's overrated. That's where that comes from. Is right. it's just like it's just a real basic story of some super angsty kids that kids, literally kids, uh, mm -hmm. that have no hope left in life and they're gonna kill themselves right. over puppy love. And everybody has experienced puppy love when growing up Absolutely. for the most, you know, uh, I say everybody, I'm sure there's, you know, an example out there of it's not happening, but everybody has experienced that feeling of like, I can't go on without this person. And oh, this is my life is over because I can't do this. Da, 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 I'm going to end it all. Sure. I'm sure everyone's felt that way, but it's just over the top. And it may be a product of, of course, it's a product of its time. That's when it was made. But right. it, it may have been meant more so for that audience and not necessarily hold up over time because it is much more grandiose and, and very much, you know, it's like an opera, basically, at this point. Um, but it, it's just too much for me. And I think it's overrated. OK, I'm going to I'm going to disagree with you there. Um, I because I uh -oh, think here we go. I mean, I, I think it is overrated as a love story. But if you like. Like if you're actually like watching it, like as a, you know, it they're I think they're meant to be overwritten that way because the like the the Capulets, you know, and the Montagues and the princes, uh, they're all written pretty much, you know, the same as all the other Shakespearean characters are in terms of their intensity level. But it's Romeo and Juliet that are like way up there because it's kind of, I think, showing that like you're a little ridiculous as a teenager. You know, you make a lot of bad choices when you're 14 or 17. So I think that people taking that as like, oh, this is a really pure good love story. They are misunderstanding it because it's it's not Shakespeare wasn't saying that. Like if you look at um, Taming of the Shrew, that's a much better love story between like, you know, older characters. But I, I think Fair he point. was almost mocking 
young love in that, in a, in a sense, is kind of my take on it. For mine, since we've already talked about English Patient and Titanic, I'll go to my third one, which I have seen on a ton of lists, and I can agree to an extent because I feel like this movie should have completely kept the romance story out of it because it it was just not needed. It was still an enticing story without it. Um, it's one of my favorite movies up until the last 20 minutes. We talked about it earlier. Jerry Maguire. Okay, I'm gonna tell you <gasps> why. Hear, hear me out. Hear me out. God damn it. <laughs> For a Son of a bitch. It was on my it. top 10 list. It's, I just didn't it's mention it. It's on my that. top 10 of favorite of favorite movies. I've seen Jerry Maguire. I've never seen, I haven't seen 200 times like, you know, Gary saw Ghostbusters, but I've certainly seen it 50, 60 times. It's that good of a movie. My point is that Jerry Maguire is a, it's a story about finding yourself and, uh, almost a road to redemption because, you know, Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooden Jr., you know, they both they both start out at certain areas of the of the hill and or the, the prism and then they rise up and and meet in the middle at the end. Uh, and it's just it's supposed to be a story of inspiration and, and triumph. And there is a love aspect between I think the love aspect between honestly father and son between Tom Cruise and Jonathan Lipnicki is stronger than the the relationship between Renee Zellweger and and Tom Cruise honestly I felt that just the story between them was just so weak and it it just didn't need to be told like that granted one of the you know you had me at hello I, I bust into the room I, I can I speak to my wife I want to talk to my wife like those are iconic lines I get it but it it just seemed like it wasn't needed. It it just seemed like it it wasn't there. It wasn't. It shouldn't be the main driving force of the story. And I actually kind of got annoyed when I saw Jerry Maguire on a bunch of these romance lists. I was like, it's not it's not a romance film. Romance is a very small subsection of it, and it's not done well. Even though it, like I said, it is still one of my favorite fucking movies. I just maybe it's just the fact that Renee Zellweger as a as an not an actress, but a a, a leading Tread love lightly. interest woman. You know what I'm I mean? Not. Why? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, I don't even right? know where to start with this critique. <laughs> um. Okay. Well, it it sounds like you don't agree with me. So why don't you agree with me? What do you What do you think I'm wrong on? I I mean I wasn't prepared. I mean, first of all, I think Cameron Crowe <laughs> would. I love completely Crow. disagree with you. That's, I think that's the funny. brilliance of Ca Cameron Crowe no is that he takes, that. and recently he's very much failed at this with like films like We Bought a Fucking Zoo, but um, <laughs> he takes... I forgot that he did that. His He great. takes every single one of his stories. There's, a, there's love at the center of it because he's a super romantic guy, right? And he takes his films to the edge when he's at his best to the edge of being too fucking cheesy. Right. And then he just somehow manages to pull it off. And it's just mm -hmm. this lovely little whimsical story. And I don't think that you can have that movie without the love interest. In it. I mean, I don't even know what that movie would look like. Right. I, I didn't say and that he shouldn't whole, have any love interest. I said, whole, it shouldn't be the driving theme. It shouldn't be the main point of the plot. Because it's not. It's like saying almost. It, sorry, keep going. I, I shouldn't interrupt. Go ahead. But that was, you know, like he he was a superficial dude right. who didn't know how to love or be right. vulnerable. And mm -hmm. through his relationship with Renee Zellweger and with Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character, he he figured out how to how to really love somebody. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't some big romantic, you're my soulmate type of story. It, it was, was like, not. which is why it's it not was, a romance. No, I think it was more realistic to what real love is like, you know, mm -hmm. Con convenience. <laughs> like, is that, no. what you, is that what you're saying? I don't agree with that. I'm just that sounds like what what you're saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. But no, it's not what I'm saying. I, I'm saying he he learned how to how to really love somebody like she showed him what that was like I and then he like realized he, that he loved her too I it just like took him a while they, to get they, there they they had so they established at the beginning that he was trying to find himself with you know this affirmation that he has 
that or this, that he that he has that he's like oh i need to be true to myself and we should we should treat all our clients like family and be honest with them and that's that's admirable that's great i'm glad he did that that starts the entire the, the entire important theme of the movie that's a really sorry that's a really sorry way of trying to portray love being like to me the way that their relationship was portrayed through the through the dialogue and through the actual acting of the characters was that it was just based out of convenience and they they she has a line in the movie where she goes i have a guy that loves my son and really likes me that's that's how it came across to me that they really liked each other just if you really like somebody you shouldn't just be marrying them you should you should be in love so uh really quick films that we for, uh, romantic films that we've forgotten about that stand the test of time that we don't really talk about much anymore um jess i'll 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 go ahead and start with you on this one uh what jumps out to you you know a really good one that i like that i feel like people don't talk about is a movie called return to me mm -hmm. starring david Duchovny and minnie driver okay do you ever see this movie i don't think so i don't even it's i don't even great. know if i've heard that one it it came out maybe in like the late nineties or early two thousands and okay um you know it's just a I mean the story the the story is ridiculous right it it involves like a heart transplant and then you know a dead wife and meeting a new girl and all this stuff but it's executed really well and it's just really sweet story for me it's 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 got to be Roman Holiday I feel like a lot of people don't remember how great Cary Grant was back in his heyday. The fact that he was, you know, he was, he was Tom Hanks before, and, you know, and Russell Crowe and Denzel Washington and just like all those, those high point leading men um, before they even came around. Um, that's actually, I, I got to ride, I got to do a scooter tour in Rome uh, with my girlfriend last year. And I've always wanted to do that. It's been on my bucket list because I watched Roman holiday. Um, and that's just, it's just a really fun romance movie you know and it's just a fun movie in general uh and i don't feel like people talk about it as much we talk about casablanca we talk about gone with the wind but we forget about roman holiday so hats off to you roman holiday i'm i'm still thinking of you uh gary how about you uh, my recommendation or for, for the uh ones we haven't uh heard recently thought of recently that's the word i'm looking for there you go <laughs> uh I would say that for me, uh, there's a movie that came out in the mid 2000s called The Story of Us that had Bruce Willis in it. Um, and I can't remember the lady that was in it. Michelle um, Pfeiffer. It, thank you. Thank you very much. But it was about a married <laughs> couple and uh, like how their relationship was on the rocks um, and the good times and the bad times they kind of go through. And uh, I think that's uh, I think that was a, re a really interesting and fun movie to watch and both of them i think do a good job in that movie and i don't think many people have heard about that movie so it's a rob reiner film i'm surprised yep. i've never heard of it yep. before. rob yeah. reiner's in it and he's hilarious as he usually is um 26 on rotten tomatoes you know what yeah i remember I, when it came out it was really panned by critics i know we don't we it don't was. follow rotten tomatoes uh, <laughs> the, the like room is like what 22 most people don't like yes. something like that yeah. that's true we, we we do like a lot of films uh, that so that, like. that would be my uh, uh, uncut gem from today. Okay, Michael, how about you? Which uh, which one do you think that we need to start talking about again that people don't mention very often? It's it's kind of difficult because we've already mentioned so many romance movies and sure. ones that keep popping out that that we've all seen, we've all talked about, and you know, kind of comes up in conversation every once in a while. And really, when you ask me that question, the only things that come to mind for me are movies that aren't necessarily romance movies. It's the problem. I'm running into the same problem that okay. I run into with Edward Scissorhands, right? Sure. Is that, as Gary was saying before, there's this great consistency between all these movies where you, it's difficult to think of a movie where there's not like a romance aspect to it yeah. or that it makes up some part of the storyline. may not necessarily be the center point of the entire movie, but there are these little gems that are hidden throughout. And one of them that I think about is The Night Before. So it's a 2015 okay. movie, Seth Rogen, yep. uh, Joseph Gordon-Lovett. Anthony McKee. Yep, here. and there's this great romance that's happening in the middle of this comedy where Joseph Gordon-Lovett is kind of coming to terms with getting back together. I'm trying to think of the character's name, Diana. 
Um, I don't remember. It's been a while. Yeah, it's, it's getting back together with her. And, and this is kind of the back and forth of as they're trying to get to that nutcracker ball right. where it run into, but then miss, but then run back and uh, kind of how the relationship intertwines. And as the movie goes on, they're giving you little bits more to their past and to their history of like, why are they no longer together? What are the problems they're facing? How are they going to overcome it? And it's kind of just a neat B plot in right. that entire film. But I suppose you could say the same thing about something like uh, Batman Returns between Batman and Selena Kyle with Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, and Michael Keaton. That's always a great romance story to me, too. That sits there in a movie that is not absolutely not a romance movie. Yeah. But it's just a lot of fun to see relationships like that grow. And though they may not end up together in the end, there is absolutely chemistry and absolutely a relationship that is developing there. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a love triangle because you've got sort of Batman and Catwoman and then also Penguin involved in that too, right? No, that's yeah. really gross. Yeah. Um, what if they remade Twins <laughs> <laughs> where Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger fall in love? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that would be an incest film. <laughs> yes. yes, it would. Be Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones. Except oh, that could have been a like Game of Thrones. You know what? You know what genre we could have talked about um, Which that one? we didn't is incestual dramas. Well, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we could talk about that if you wanted to. Um, <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know he was my brother. Um, <laughs> um, you know, first love movies, right? Like there are. Be Very few films. Chick flicks. <laughs> yeah, because we all know what that's like. The first time you're young, the first time you really fall in love, and then the first time you get your heart broken. Like that is, those are some of the most intense feelings you're ever going to feel in your life. And it's really right. specific to that first time you have those feelings. And, and some movies are really great at capturing it just exactly what that the intensity of that and the heartbreak of that we didn't really touch on that today that would have been a good one to talk about that would have been a good one thanks for telling us how we could do our jobs better i'm sorry I'm, I'm glad, i realized I'm glad you got to come to your first it, and last episode ever i remember i was saying it i was like man i'm <laughs> critiquing the podcast i'm sorry you're, you're not it's really okay <laughs> That's awesome. But. Um, so, guys, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, Jess, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure actually being able to get you on finally. Hopefully we can do it again soon. Um, before we go, though, it is very, very common of us to give out our movie picks of the week. And we're going to keep the trend rolling today. Um, so basically, uh, everybody on the panel just goes ahead and gives out one film that they think our audience should try to watch during that week, um, preferably something that is related to the topic of that episode. So um, let's go ahead and we'll we'll start with uh, we'll start with Gary. We'll start with the host to give our our guests uh, a second to, to pick something. Um, Gary, what, what do you recommend for our listeners to watch here on this Valentine's Day week? On this Valentine's Day week, I'm going to recommend a romance movie that I know Johnny will hate. Uh, it's a movie called Bicentennial Man God with Robin it. Williams. Um, the movie you know me so well. <laughs> yes, I know. The, <laughs> I fucking the, hate that movie. <laughs> Robin Williams plays a uh, an android or a robot, I guess, uh, that uh, starts to become more human um, as the uh, ep epic continues and uh, falls in love with the. Uh, granddaughter of sam neil his original owner mm -hmm. and he, he kind of learns to you know be what what a human being is and what emotions are um and i to me it's a really great movie and i just i guess it's just because johnny has terrible taste in film he doesn't like it yeah. but uh that's, that, that's uh that's a really fantastic uh finding yourself slash romance movie in my opinion um i'm gonna go to one that i kind of just brushed over earlier um, that I think that we, it, it still, still holds up to this day. You may disagree and say that it's more of a comedy than is anything, but I still say it's a rom-com and something that we also didn't talk about that we should have was love triangles. You had mentioned that a second ago. Um, some like it hot was the one that I had, I had brought up earlier. Um, uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon. Probably I'd say that's one of my t easily one of my top 10 favorite comedies of all time or rom-coms. Uh, it's just, it just always holds up, man. Uh, two people fighting after an, one person uh, and their mixed feelings going back and forth. Uh, of course, in this one, she 
doesn't know until later on that they're they're who they say they are. Uh, I don't want to give it away, even though it's been decades, decades old. Uh, <laughs> but check it out if you haven't seen it. Uh, that's my recommendation for this week. Some like it hot. Uh, Michael, what do you what do you got for our viewers this week? Some like it hot. That's uh, at the end when he's like, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yeah, that's that was it. a great movie. <laughs> that's a fantastic film. So I'm going to break tradition a little bit and actually give two on this one. Um, yep. First one, safe one. Most audiences can see it and not have a problem. Uh, let's go ahead and go with Splash, 1984. Uh, Behold, yep. you're it's, it's a terribly great movie. Like, like Daryl Hannah does a really good job of playing that. Tom yes. Hanks does a really good job. Like, it's, it's, it's just a fun movie. Uh, I think in 1984, like definitely go, go see that movie. Um, the one that's a little bit more risque and may not necessarily be for everybody in the audience, um, because it is, it, it could make some people uncomfortable watching it, right? Just because of the subject matter on okay. it. Uh, mm-hmm. there's a little film from 2013 called Get and Go. Um, I remember you talked about this earlier. Right. So mm-hmm. it, it is an LGBT movie. Mm-hmm. And what it is, is it's basically the story of this guy who is attracted to a go-go dancer mm-hmm. in a New York City nightclub. One night gets drunk, sends the guy an email uh, posing as a documentary maker saying, hey, can I follow you around to make this documentary film? Mm-hmm. And then the go-go dancer responds saying, yeah, sure. And it's this relationship that develops between the two of them. But it gets into some really kind of gritty stuff within the gay community when it comes to the nightclub scene, when it comes to drug use, when it comes to promiscuity, when it comes to kind of all of those aspects that that follow in. So it's it's an interesting watch, especially if if there's not a lot of movies out there that make you uncomfortable when it comes to adult themes or or sex scenes or anything like that. So check it out. It's actually a pretty good movie. Okay. I I love movies that make me uncomfortable. So hell, I'm going to, Oh, it's free on Tubi right now. So maybe I'll be watching that tonight. Pornhub. (laughs) (laughs) You know that what's funny is I know you joke about that, but nowadays you can actually find a ton of free movies streaming on Pornhub. You remember hearing about that? They actually took about 70% of Pornhub's content before, before I've heard a couple months ago. Yeah. You heard? Well, you heard, about it yeah if it makes you if it makes you happy the go-go dancer within that movie actually is a porn star so you can oh, find films of him you if you try <laughs> it'll be easier than you think uh jess how about you i also was gonna recommend two um yeah good and these are both uh, these are both lgbtq movies as well one i think perfectly captures that i've never seen a movie do it so well captures what it's like to really fall in love and have your you know have all those feelings for the first time and it's called call me by your name beautiful film if you haven't seen it you should watch it and also um a film called weekend which is a british film about two men who just meet and it just sort of follows them around um while they get to know each other for a couple of days um, over a weekend. And it is okay. really simple, very, very good quality movie um, that not a lot of people have seen. So I recommend those two. Perfect. OK, well, I, I think uh, a very, very solid grouping of films for our viewers to check out this week. Uh, so for all you guys, uh, you know, snuggle up with your loved one or your furry friend or a blanket oh boy, or that could mean something completely different <laughs> well i was just meaning have... like a cat or a dog but okay. you know hey yeah. gary your uh, your mind can do whatever Ash, did it, you know it wants those, to go. those costumes <laughs> those furry costumes are like thousands of dollars oh yeah i had no idea that is people's I... entire lives yep <laughs> They have entire conventions regarding this that yeah. are very strange. In fact, Internet Historian uh, does a really good video on that. Uh, do, you we... remember, oh, do you remember that? Do you remember that? Go from romance films to furry friends. Go well, ahead, do you remember MTV True Life? Um, yep. They had MTV True Life, I'm a Furry. Classic. Yep. <laughs> and there's romance there. I think people should watch that. So snuggle up with your furry friends. With your furry, with your furry furries, and uh, check out one of the many, many great <laughs> romance or rom coms that we uh, recommended for you this week. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us, Michael, Jess. Always a pleasure. Hope to have you guys back again soon. Uh, uh, for myself and Gary and Neil, we'll see you guys next week. Stay classy. 
Thank you for tuning in to Lead Feather Productions' podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Lead Feather Production. Copyright Lead Feather Productions 2021. I wanted it to be you, Gary. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nor- are, we, are we still recording? Paranormal romance. What the fuck, Johnny? <laughs>